Hello, and welcome to the Terrell Museum Speaker Series Thursday. And today it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Hanneke Meyer. She's Associate Professor at the University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, she's a paleoornithologist uh, with particular interest in extinct island birds, and she's going to be presenting some of her research on Flores, an island in eastern Indonesia. So without further ado, I'll hand you back to Hanika. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Jeff. I'm just going to share my screen and then we can get started. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hanika Meyer. I am a bird paleontologist. And I am based at the University of Bergen in Norway. And tonight I, well, for me, it's in the evening. For you, it's in the morning. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, an island far, far away, uh, the island of Flores in the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, and I'll be talking about my research there and the research that I have conducted together with uh, a big team of international scientists um, over the last decade or so and it has a lot of backstory so I hope that you will um, be able to follow along and if not we'll always have time for questions at the end of the talk. So when I talk about an island far far away um, for some of us this is further away than others so mo if most of you are based in Drumheller tonight we'll be taking a trip to the other side of the globe and all the way to the Indonesian archipelago where it's nice and warm right now uh, and we'll be focusing tonight on the Indonesian island of Flores. And Flores is indicated here in the little rectangle uh, and is located in the eastern part of the Indonesian archipelago. And it is part of a larger chain of islands that lies between the, the big land masses of Australia, which is here on the right, and so Southeast um, Asia, which is here on the left. Um, now, this this whole area of islands here in the middle is referred to as Wallachia. And uh, this set of islands uh, has never been connect connected to either mainland Southeast Asia or Australia. Even at times of so low sea level, um, some parts of, of the region connected to each other. And this is indicated here by the blue uh, outlines. So on the left, uh, a big part of Malaysia and northern Indonesia was connected in a larger part of land that's referred to as Sunda land, whereas parts of northern Australia were connected to Papua New Guinea, and that area is often referred to as Sahu. And during times of low sea level, you could walk from northern Australia all the way to Papua New Guinea, but you could not get to Flores because even at times of low sea level, this area of, of, uh, of the archipelago was still surrounded by water. And most of the area is so deep that even at the points in time where seawater was at its at it lowest level, there was still never a dry connection to these islands. So these islands are about five to 10 million years old, but during those times, they have never been connected to any part of either Sahu or Sundaland. And this is an important part of the story because when we're thinking about how animals and plants spread to these islands, we have to take into account that these animals and plants had to cross large water barriers. And when we're looking at the fauna and flora on these islands, we see that this is like a subset of the, the plants and animals that we find in either Sahul and Sunderland. This is because not all animals and plants are equally good at crossing these water barriers. And particularly when it comes to animals, animals like elephants and rats and bats and birds, those are very well capable of crossing these water barriers. And those are the type of animals that we often see on these islands. And in contrast, animals like tigers and lions, hyenas, those are not very good at crossing water. So those tend to be absent from these areas. And this unique area, the unique nature of this region was first recognized by Alfred Wallace, <clears throat> who was a naturalist uh, and a contemporary of Charles Darwin, actually. And uh, Alfred Wallace was very interested in exploring patterns in biodiversity. And he was one of the earliest ones who who, who traveled out to this region and started mapping some of the 
animals and plants that he saw. And he noticed that this region referred to as Wallachia um, after his death, that this area was very different from Sundaland on the left. And the pattern was most sharply different at the red line here, which is referred to as the Wallace line, because that line really demarcates the boundary between certain animal groups, which are either absent or uh, present in this area. And then something similar is happening on the eastern border of Wallachia. Um, that line is referred to as Lidecker's line and separates the flora and fauna from Savoland from that of Wallachia. And even though for certain groups, these areas are very distinct borders, uh, for other groups such as plants, this area is a bit more of a transitional area. But however, um, the fact remains that Wallachia is a very distinct group with a very distinct uh, biodiversity and a lower number of species generally. So with that kind of background in mind, we go back to 1948. And that was the time when uh, a Dutch priest, Father Theo Verhoeven, uh, arrived on the island of Flores. And our Father Theo was actually born not too far from where I'm sitting right now in the Netherlands, in the southern part of the Netherlands. And he was a Catholic priest um, who had been trained um, um, for a life as a missionary his whole life. Um, and he was supposed to be sent out uh, to um, a post around the world where he would take up a life as a missionary and teach the local people and try to convert them. Now, Father Verhoeven had actually done a PhD on uh, classical literature from Greek and Rome times, and uh, he was very interested in history. Um, even though he was a missionary, he really wanted to keep his brain busy with, with some of these, these topics. Um, and when he arrived on Flores, um, he realized pretty quickly that there was no opportunity for him, for him to really continue his studies in that field. Um, but he did have a lot of opportunity for prehistoric research because when he came to Flores, nobody had really, well, I should say no Westerner had really studied any prehistorical um, uh, things about the island. Um, and I have to say that his superiors were not very happy with these plans because they were afraid it was going to take up a lot of time because what he was supposed to do was actually teach the locals uh, about Christianity and also write a dictionary uh, translating words from Latin into the local language and back again. But it was quickly that he realized that the island around him had a lot of potential for exploring. So he, uh, as much as his time permitted him, which was not a lot of time because he only had the weekends available and the holidays, he took that time to explore as much of the island as possible. And oh, during the next 10 years, he, he used as much of his free time as he could to explore a lot of caves and rock shelters on Flores. And the map on top of this, in the, on top of the slide, shows a lot of his sites that he explored during these ten years. Uh, and in many caves, he found the remains um, of animals, of bones, and sometimes also small stone tools and artifacts. And these he described in in various papers and reports that he published in a small German journal. And in total, we know that he explored around. 60 cave sites and rock shelters all over the island. And many of them we haven't gone back to. So he did a lot of work in this, in this time period. And even though he never really excavated very deep, uh, his work forms the basis of what a lot of us uh, do today. So after um, a couple of years, on a Monday morning, on Monday, August 28th, from his diaries, we know that... Um, he left the island or his, um, oh, there we go. that he left the, the seminary where he was, he was working with two other priests, uh, Father Monastek and Father Piet Smits, and they left to a small village referred to as uh, Terras. And Terras is, is a small settlement north of one of the bigger cities on Flores called Routeng. And there they found, they visited a cave site called Liangbua. And this is a picture from, I think it's the 1970s. So uh, Liangbua was uh, very much overgrown at the time. And Father Verhoeven found out that they were uh, 
this cave was often being used as a as a school, uh, often for multiple classes in, at once because it was a rather big cave. And the locals refer to this cave as Liangbua. And Liangbua in the local language means cool cave. And uh, during times of the year, this part of the world can get very warm. So people were using this cave to take shelter from the heat. And uh, it was also used for stalling uh, cattle and teaching people, uh, teaching classes. So it was very, at that point, very much in use with the local people. Um, he only had a day or two to explore the cave. So he never really made more notes on that. And we know that it wasn't until 1965 that he was able to return to Liangbua again. So this is 17 years after he arrived on the island. And that time he planned to do a test excavation. So these are two of his drawings from his diaries. And here on the left, there is, so this is the outline of the cave over here. This here at the lower side is the, uh, the opening. And he, this particular square form here is the area that he, where he did a test excavation. Now we know that he, from his nose, that he only went about a meter, a meter and a half deep. Um, and he found a number of skeletons that are indicated in this image on the right. And they were all oriented in the same way with the heads and feet pointing in the same direction. So this was very exciting and he wrote uh, a few papers on it. And these are, these are clearly modern human burials. They were not very old. They were about three to 4,000 years old. Um, but this was certainly a very interesting finding. And the, the Indonesian government and Indonesian scientists took an interest in it as well. So in, um, in the seventies, research at Liangbua was taken up by Indonesian archeologist Raden Suyono uh, who was, is also called, well, is referred to as the grandfather of Indonesian archaeology, a very well-known archaeologist. And for 10 years, they excavated at Liangua. And um, uh, they found a lot of uh, Holocene material, so material up till about 10,000 years old. Um, and a lot of this uh, is still in storage at the National Museum in Jakarta. Um, but they never really went any deeper. So they stayed only in the Holocene layers and they found remains of modern humans and modern burials, um, pottery, stone tools, uh, nothing too spectacular, if I may say so. And then in 2001, um, Australian archeologist, Mike Morewood joined Raden Siono. And Mike Morewood had been working on sites in Australia a lot and he was very curious as to know where the first Australians had come from. And according to Mike, um, they must have come through Indonesia. So Mike wanted to take uh, this chance to, to see if he could find older evidence for people on Flores. Uh, so he joined the, the excavations at Liangbua and Mike was used to employing what is a technique of excavating that's called deep trench archaeology. And this means that um, there's a focus on getting to the bottom of the cave as quickly as possible. Um, so that meant that often um, the caves, the, the excavations went down six, seven, eight, sometimes 11 meters deep. And in this picture here on the right, you see what that looked like. Uh, now, Liangboa is, is, well, the whole island of Flores uh, is volcanic. So there is the risk of, of uh, earth tremors and, and earthquakes. Uh, and some of, the moist, some of the sediments are still wet at times of the year. So this is a very tricky business. And therefore, a lot of the sediments were, were um, scaffolded using planks and, and platforms to keep it as stable as possible. Uh, but even at a depth of 11 meters, uh, oxygen would be very low and light would be very low. So it was often a very dangerous, dangerous uh, business of doing that. Luckily, nothing serious ever happened, but you can imagine and if an earthquake happened and you're working in soft sediment, that it can be very, very dangerous very quickly. Um, but Mike's strategy um, paid off because in 2003, on Tuesday, September the 2nd, uh, one of the excavators uh, named Benjamin Tarus was he is pictured here on the left in the white hat and on the right hat in on the right hand side is Indonesian archaeologist Thomas Sutikna. Uh, ben was excavating at the bottom of one of the trenches 
at around six meters deep. And Benjamin is a very skilled excavator. He's been working with the team for maybe 20 years now. So he knows exactly what he's doing and he knows exactly what to look for. And he was trolling away some of the sediments and then he hit something. And that turned out to be a skull. And that one is in the, in the image here in the middle. It's that skull. And that skull turned out to be something very, very different. Um, and it turned out to be the skull of a new species of hominin called Homo floresiensis. And uh, it was not just a skull that, that was found at the depth. There was a partial skeleton, uh, which is together referred to as LB1, which forms the reference type or the holotype of, of this new species. Um, and LB1 is also has a nickname called Flo, uh, because it's a female. Uh, and LB1 was only the first of nine in the nine partial individuals that have been found. We know that there were the remains of at least nine different individuals that were buried all those uh, meters below the surface. And Homo floresiensis is a species that is very, very different from us, even though we're in the same genus. It is something that completely, it was completely unexpected and challenged a lot of things that we thought we understood about human evolution. Um, it, was own, it was very small. It was, its, its height is estimated at around 106 centimeters. So that's basically a child's height. Uh, it had a weight of around 27 kilos. Uh, it had a very small brain size, 426 square centimeters, which is a lot smaller than uh, what is uh, reported for our own species, which is over a thousand square uh, centimeters. It had relatively long arms. It had relatively big feet. Um, so this is a very strange combination. Of, of, speci of characteristics that we had not seen before in any other species of extinct hominin. And this is why people were very excited, but also very skeptical about this new strange creature that was found here. And it created a lot of interest. It created also a lot of controversy. Um, the papers were published in the scientific journal Nature, um, which was, uh, made it a very big story. Uh, and here on the right, you see a comparison between LB1 skull and a modern human skull. And you can see how much smaller it is and how much different it looks. And even though it is this much smaller, it is a fully grown adult. So we're not looking at a child. We're not looking at something that hasn't, hasn't grown, hasn't matured yet. It is a fully functioning adult. And at that, side, that age, it was so much smaller than a modern human, which was incredible. Um, and because of these characteristics, the short stature, the big feet, the long arms, these creatures very quickly got the nickname Hobbits from the famous books by, uh, by Tolkien because they shared so many of the features. Um, so they now go by the name of Hobbits. Um, of course, many questions arose about where did this strange creature come from? What, what are we to think about this, this very strange skeleton from this faraway island in Indonesia? Um, as it happened, uh, on nearby Java, there had been already uh, fossils found of another species of fossil hominin, Homo erectus. And we know that they were already on, the, on Java by about 1.8 million years ago, which is a long, long time before, um, uh, before the end of the Pleistocene, the, the period where Homo floresiensis comes from. Um, and uh, thinking back about the, 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 the distinct features of all the islands in Malaysia, it's very common for large mammal species to become smaller. This is called island dwarfing. And we know that it happens in elephants. We know that it happens in, in deer. We know that it happens in a lot of animals. So could it have happened to humans? That's one of the hypotheses that was put forward was that Homo floresiensis is a species of dwarfed Homo erectus. Um, that seems to be supported by some of the anatomical features. For example, the small brain and the teeth are very similar to that of Homo erectus. Um, one of the questions that remains with this hypothesis is that how did they get to Flores? Because even though Flores might look very close to Java um, in terms of, of distance, 
it's still separated from several of the nearby islands by very deep trenches of seawater, even at times of low sea level. And uh, one of the key objections is that we always thought that it was modern humans only that could make boats and could cross large water bodies. So if that's the case, how did this old pre-human, pre-modern human species get to Flores Island? And that is something that has not been resolved yet. So that's definitely one of the questions that we have. Um, but some of the other anatomical features seem to paint a different picture for Homo floresiensis. Um, some of the features, for example, the shoulder and some, the, some details of the feet uh, suggest that Homo floresiensis is actually quite close to some of the early hominins that left, that, that uh, we find in, in Africa. For example, the Australopithecine species of Lucy um, and some other of the early Homo species that we find in Africa. But it's more closely related to those species than it is to Homo erectus that we find on Java. So exactly how we can explain this is, is unclear. It might be that this species is a different lineage that came well after Homo erectus already had reached Africa. Um, there's at this point no evidence that another species left Africa, but this is one of the questions that people that are working on these topics uh, are trying to solve at the moment. However, some, some people were not convinced that this was a distinct species on its own at all. Um, there were various um, questions raised about the authenticity of, this, of the bone material. Was it really a new species or was this just a, uh, an isolated population of, of modern humans that had a disease that were somehow uh, had pathologies that made them um, live in this isolated area? And several um, hypotheses were put forward Several patho pathologies were suggested, such as microcephaly, uh, which explains the small brain and also the short statue, endemic cretinism, which is an uh, iodine deficiency that can lead to short statue. Uh, Leron syndrome is a growth hormone insensitivity. Even Down syndrome has been suggested as a, uh, as a possible explanation. However, what these, these hypotheses fail to take into account is that this is a population of uh, hominins that lived over many, many millennia. And um, we have at least nine individuals that all show the same features, that all show that they're fully grown, that they're not children, they don't show any other signs of pathologies. So the pathology uh, hypothesis does not seem to hold up when we really, really look at the evidence very closely. And I think it's safe to say at this point that the consensus is that it's either uh, a dwarf species of Homo erectus or an earlier species from Africa. But the pathology hypothesis has been rejected by most experts working in the field of paleoanthropology. But the reason that this pathology hypothesis has, 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 uh, has gained so much ground is that um, th th there are two reasons for that. The first is that the initial dating results were a bit of a unfortunate misinterpretation. And then the second is that if we have to under, if we want to understand the evolution of Homo floresiensis, we have to look at the whole ecosystem. We cannot just single out one species and try to explain it without taking into account the whole ecosystem that it evolved in uh, and, and really functioned very well in that. Um, so that is something that I really want to highlight with my talk is the, the faunal context. And I will show you the other animals that lived alongside Homo floresiensis. And hopefully that will paint a better picture of the ecosystem at the time. And it, make it makes it, for me, it makes it a lot more logical. Uh, it makes a lot more sense in trying to understand how Homo floresiensis evolved. So when I'm saying that the initial results were a bit of a mis, mis unfortunate mishappening. Um, this is a picture of some of the layers uh, in which we find the hobbit uh, bones. And here's Benjamin again, trying very carefully excavating some of the bones. Um, and if we look at the right, we see that here, there's a big layer of white sediments. And these are actually a volcanic ashes. It's a tephra. Um, and we refer to this one as the white tuff. And there are actually multiple 
layers, multiple volcanic eruptions that accumulated uh, during that point in time in the cave. And on the right side, is the right side is pointing to the opening of the cave and the, and the left side is to the back. So we see that this layer of, of volcanic tephras is kind of sloping and thinning upwards, which means that it probably came from the right. It was blown in by the right and then kind of slowly thinned as it extended back into the cave. This, this white tough layer was initially dated in, uh, in the beginning of the research. And uh, we know that it's dates to around 13,000 years. Now, all the Hobbit remains are below these white tough layers. So it makes sense that this white tough layer gives an estimate of the, old, the youngest age of the Hobbits. So it was suggested that the Hobbits were around until around 15 to 13,000 years ago. However, what at the time wasn't really noticed and what we've only come to understand during the last 10 years is that here is a sloping layer that uh, at the, in the initial excavations wasn't very visible, but we know that it's there now. And this layer, and then here in the upper left, there's a thin layer of black sediment. It might be a black uh, layer of black volcanic tuff. And <clears throat> now we know that this yellow layer is actually an erosional surface. And uh, we now know that these layers are also much older than the 13,000 years that the white tub dates to. Um, this is a, a, a figure that is the result of 10 years of very detailed excavating, very carefully tracing the layers in the cave by, by the archeologists on the team. Not me, because I'm terrible with this, but other people have done this for us. Um, and here again on the left side, you see these white bands that are the white tough layer. Now here, when I mentioned this thin strip of black uh, tough, we know that those are the remnants of a much thicker layer of black ashes that are more towards the back of the cave. And these cover um, a lot of sediment and these are dated to around 50 to 60,000 years ago. And we know that now that these are the original layers of the cave and that sedimentary uh, erosional layer that we saw in the previous slide is the white layer here in the middle. So here, this is the erosional surface. So we know that these older layers here, the black tough layer in, in the, if we, would, we were to go back in time 60,000 years ago, it covered the whole cave. It would have covered the whole floor of the cave. Somehow, after that point in time, it got eroded out from the entrance of the cave, slowly, little by little. And then around 13,000 years ago, new ash layer was deposited on top of that. And this makes it very confusing because even though the white ash layer is lower in the stratigraphy than the black layer, the black layer is older. So that has, that's a very confusing concept and it, it, it makes things very complicated. Uh, now, the, the skeleton that I showed you a few slides ago uh, of Homo floresiensis, which is referred to as LB1, was located just below that erosional boundary over here. And we think that if it had been another thousand years before uh, this layer uh, was deposited on top of it, the holotype would have been eroded out. It would have been washed away out of the cave with the rest of the material. So we're very lucky that it didn't happen and it was preserved somehow by new sediments that came in. Uh, but this means that the, the Hobbit skeleton, all the skeletal remains are actually in a layer that's much older than we initially thought. So instead of the Hobbit being uh, um, around 13,000 years ago, uh, 13,000 years old, it pushes it back to at least 50, 60,000 years. And that changes things because we know that hum modern humans weren't around back then in this part of the world. So it could not have been a modern human. We know that already from the skeleton, but now we also know it, now the timing also fits that, that hypothesis. Um, so this is a very, it was for us a very key moment of, of understanding the stratigraphy in the cave. And this also makes it very unlikely that it was just a population of diseased modern humus, as some people um, cling to still. Um, so here is a picture of a little bit more back into the cave. And here we really see this 
thick layer of black tuff very clearly. It's almost, uh, at some places, almost a meter thick. Um, and we refer to this, this black tuff layer as T3, tuff for number three, because there are several tuffers in the sequence. So this is T3. And all the hobbit remains are found underneath this layer. This is the key marker for the whole stratigraphy. Anything under this big volcanic layer is at least 50,000 years old. Um, we don't have any hobbit bones that are above this layer. Above this layer, we only find evidence for modern humans. We find uh, introduced animals. We find pigs. We find uh, horses. We do not find anything out of the ordinary. But below that tough layer, that's where we find the really interesting things. And I'm not talking just about the hobbit layers. We find, we find all kinds of things, interesting animals below this layer. And this layer, the sediments underneath T3 span back to all the way to 190,000 years. And that's about where we get to the bottom of the cave. So that's a very thick layer of sediments. So this is another view of uh, the, one of the surfaces of the Hobbit layers. And um, there's a lot going on in this picture. <laughs> there's a lot of bone material in this. Um, in this square, you, there's a lot of um, small stone tools, but they're, they're very difficult to see. But there's a lot of bone remains and not only from Hobbits. Um, the two arrows here, over here and here, they point to two mandibles. And those are mandibles of elephants and not just any elephants. Those are the mandibles of pygmy elephants. Um, and this is a species of pygmy elephant that is called Stegodon florensis insularis, which is an extinct relative of modern elephants. Uh, and we know actually that a lot of the islands in Southeast Asia used to have elephants um, in the past. A lot of them have gone extinct, sadly. Um, most of the stegodons, well, all stegodons have gone extinct. Um, and Flores also had different types of stegodons at different points in time. And this is the youngest species that we find on Flores. And it was, it was really quite small for an elephant. It was about one meter, 1.8 meter high for an adult, which is not very high. And most of the bone material that we find at Liangbua are actually uh, juveniles. So this, this mandible over here that's numbered four is a little over 10 centimeters wide. So you can imagine that if these stegodons were juveniles, they would have been the size of a, of a big dog. So um, we could have had, if they had still lived today, we could have had pet elephants. So it's always a good reminder of what we've lost in the past. Uh, stegodon was likely to be a herbivore um, they likely fed on a lot of grass and, and small herbs in the area. And Stegonon disappears around from Liangbua area around 50,000 years ago. We don't find them uh, in the younger layers above the, the Tephras. We only find them under the black layer. So this is similar to the hobbits. They don't seem to persist after 50,000 years ago. Another animal that I always I found very fascinating and that we, we find uh, not a lot of bones from, but we know that they're there, are the Komodo dragons. The so Komodo dragons are a giant species of lizards that um, are still alive today. Um, today they live on the islands of Komodo and Rincha, which are two islands um, off the west coast of Flores. Um, but in the past, they used to have a much larger distribution. They were present on Flores and probably also some of the islands east of Flores as well. Um, we find them at Liangbua, mostly teeth, some bones. And similarly to, the, to Stegodon and the hobbits, we, we don't really find them anymore after 50,000 years ago. Um, so it seems that also Komodo dragons seem to disappear from Flores around the same time. Somehow they still managed to survive on some of the smaller islands um, uh, off the coast. We don't really know why they managed to survive there and not on Flores. Uh, but one theory is that they, they likely survived on carcasses of marine mammals that washed up on, on the shores. Uh, dolphins or whales or anything large that they could eat. Um, this is how they might have survived. But uh, there's something... something Still a hypothesis that we need to test. 
But the majority of bone remains um, on Liang Bua is actually not from big animals. And people always find this very surprising because uh, big animals are the ones we find so easily. But the majority, over 80% of the bone material from Liang Bua is actually from rats. And this has led some people to say that Liang Bua was not really a hobbit hole. It was more of a rat cave where hobbits were occasional visitors. Um, and this is just the bone material from, this is a graph that, that reflects the, the amount of bone material that we have from the hobbit layers. And it's almost 160,000 bone remains and uh, over 135,000 of them are rat bones. And, and not just bones, but also teeth. So that, that's an incredible amount of rats. It's just mind blowing to think of that many rats. Um, and uh, it's it's really something. It's, it's often it's the other species, the Stegodon and the Komodo dragon that get all the attention, but the rats are really, really interesting. And there's a lot of them. So here's, here's just to give you an idea how that looks like. Um, we have so much of this small bone material from the site, it's incredible. And it takes a lot of time to sort through it and to count it all, but it's been done. <clears throat> and we know that in this, these heaps of bones, that there's, um, there's a lot of rats, um, but there's also different sizes of rats. So here you see two size categories of, of femora. Uh, some are smaller, some are larger. And the largest ones actually belong to a species of rat that's still alive on the island today. This is called Papagomes, a species that is, um, it's very elusive. We don't really know much about it. The local people sometimes catch one. Um, they say that they catch them in trees, but we don't really know if they live in trees or if they get scared and try to hide in trees. But it's sometimes one of them surfaces and uh, we then measure it and it's actually eaten locally. Um, I don't think I've tried it for myself, but I can't say it with certainty. Uh, but they're very, very interesting, very large furry rats, um, which are still alive today. <clears throat> but it, that's just the biggest one. And we know that there's at least seven or eight species of rats in the whole Liangbua assemblage. And the interesting thing about rats is that we can actually, with the help of molecular analysis, we can actually determine if they lived in an area that was more forested or if they had a preference for more grassy and drier areas. So we know that some of the larger rats were more um, indicative of forested environments, particularly Papagomes, also Spileomes florendis was a forest rat. And then we know that the large and medium ones, uh, Hoyeromes nusatingara, Komodomes ringianus, and Paulames naso. Uh, Paulames, which is a fun fact, Paulames was actually named after um, the wife of Father, the later wife of Father Hoover. Father Hoover returned to the Netherlands after a long time and married someone. Um, so they named this rat species after her, which I think is very sweet. But we know that these rat species were more um, indicative of a grassy and open environment. And then the smaller one uh, is called Rattus Heinaldi. That again was a forest rat. So by looking at these species and looking at how they, they, their abundance fluctuates throughout the sequence, we can actually use these species to reconstruct what the environment around Liangbua looks like at different times. <clears throat> so from 190,000 years, so from all the way at the bottom of the sediments up until 60,000 years ago, we know that there was a mixture of both. Uh, there was a little bit of forest, but there was a lot of grassy areas. We see that the medium, like the grass rats are very, very abundant. They're almost 70% of the assembly. Whereas the forest rats are about 30%. So that probably indicates that there was a lot of grassland nearby and some trees, but mostly grassland. Now, if we go, oh, sorry, that's meant to be 50,000 to 60,000 years ago. Uh, we see that that changes. We actually see that the grass rats uh, actually decrease in abundance, they make up only around 10%. And then the forest rats are actually very, very abundant around this time. So what this means is probably around the 60,000 years ago, there was a shift in environment where the environment, the grassland kind of disappeared and it became a lot more forested and, and a clo more closed environment. 
Uh, and this is something we can tell by just counting rats, basically, which I still think is, is mind blowing. Um, so when we go from rats to birds, and even though rats are the most abundant group, um, the most species rich group for Liangbua, so the group that has the most species in it, is actually the birds. And we don't have as many bones for birds as we do for rats. Right now we have about 4,000 bird bones, but they represent almost 40 different species of birds. And um, I just love looking at this picture because it really shows the diversity of, of birds that were present around Liangbua. Um, we have some birds that are very uh, indicative of a wet environment. We have, for example, ducks, we have snipes, we have sandpipers, there's rails, all these birds that are most at home in, in wetlands and open water environments. Um, then we have a few birds that have uh, that are very common for dry lands, for grasslands, such as small quails here in the lower right. We have uh, grass birds, we have skylarks, which are all very indicative of large open areas. Um, we have a lot of forest birds. We have pigeons, uh, we have uh, a lot of songbirds, we have parrots. Um, this one here in the upper left is uh, what's called a friar bird, um, which are very common still around Liambua today. And it's actually a bird that uh, makes a distinct sound at different times of the day. And whenever we are excavating and the, the friar bird calls, it's time for coffee break. So it's, it's a coffee break bird for us. So um, it's taken me years to spot one myself because they're very good at hiding between the, the leaves and they're also very dark gray. So it makes it difficult to find them, but I finally found it. They don't look very pretty, but I, I'm particularly fond of them. Um, several songbirds, yes, we have crows. We have what's called a white eye, which is a very large group of species, of very, very small songbirds that you find almost on every island in Southeast Asia. And they have a very distinct white ring around the eyes. Uh, for the rest, they look exactly the same on every island. Uh, so they're very hard to tell apart. Uh, we have birds of prey. Over here on the right is a Brahmini kite. It's a very distinct, large bird of prey that you see a lot along open rivers and open grasslands where it's looking for prey. Um, and then we have owls, which is very interesting because a lot of these smaller bone the birds that we, and not just the birds, but also the mammals that we see inside caves are often the result of owl pellets. And we can tell this because the, the stomach acids in the owl's stomach, they, um, they slowly polish the bone. So we see that there's a certain acid etching on some of the smaller rat bones, some of the small bird bones. So we know that these bones are probably come from the pellet of an owl and were part of the owl diet. So that's another way for us to tell uh, which species were living close by to Liangbua and how we can interpret it for, um, for, for environmental purposes. And the picture of the birds really shows, again, similarly to the rats, an, an image of an area that has wetlands, it has grasslands, and it has forest, forested areas. So, even though these bones might not be as impressive as those of, let's say, an elephant or a Komodo dragon, these are actually the bones that are the most useful for us in helping us understand what the environment back in the day looked like. But there's two bird species that I really want to highlight in this talk, and they are, for us, have really been very helpful in understanding the ecosystem of Homo floresiensis. Um, and one of them is the white-headed vulture. And this is a species that is currently only found in Africa. Um, it's a species of vulture that looks very pretty. And ironically enough, when you read the literature about its behavior, it's said that it doesn't like to get dirty. It lets other, other vulture species do the dirty work first, and then it goes in and catches the, uh, it, it eats the, uh, the remains. Um, and this is a very interesting feature because we, we find some bones of, of this vulture uh, um, around Liambua, not very many, but uh, about a handful. So we know it's there. But this species uh, actually lets other species of vultures do the hard work. 
when when uh, a large herbivore, a large animal dies, uh, the first vultures that are there at the carcass are often the ones with the strongest beaks. They're the ones that open up um, the carcass and then rip out all the the, uh, the intestines. And then when the hard work is done, this one. Uh, small, some of the smaller vulture species come in and eat the rest of it. And this is an important thing to remember when we get to the next species. Because the next species, there you go. the next species of bird is actually uh, something that I never expected to find on this island. And I was very surprised when I found these birds. And this is a, uh, a shot down in one of the, uh, the sectors that we're excavating at. Um, and this bone over here that was found is a bird bone. And we didn't really know what to make of it in the beginning. Um, and then it turned out, this is the same bone here, when, after it was cleaned. And it turned out to be the foot bone, uh, the metatarsal of a large species of stork. And for scale, this is my, my, my own foot over here. I'm size seven. Um, so you can imagine that it, this is an incredible find and it really, it's, yeah, it's an amazing bone for a very large species of bird that was clear. Um, we know that this species of bird um, was about eight, at 1.8 meters tall, which is a little bit taller than I am myself. Um, and uh, these, this giant marabou stork, as we call it, it's now extinct and its nearest relative lives in Africa. And that's where they are, these large scavenger birds that you can often see uh, near uh, uh, trash areas and sitting in trees and trying to, to grab everything they can get. Um, and we, we know that now that we have several of these animals at Liangbua. So the one here in the middle is the one in the, the previous picture. And this one is a second specimen. Um, not only is it smaller, um, it is a juvenile. Uh, but uh, it's almost full grown, so it wouldn't have been much larger when it was an adult. Uh, but this is likely to be a male and a female. <clears throat> um, and now that we've, this was, uh, I think, in 2011, and over the years, more and more material has been excavated. And we now have over 40 specimens of this bird. Um, and we now know that we have over five different uh, animals in here, males, females, juveniles. Uh, so it's really been a very interesting window into, into this population of very large birds that, that were present at Flora so many years ago. And initially, uh, when I first found these bones, I, we only found a handful of bones. And I thought this, this bird is so big, it, it's impossible that it was flying because it must have been a flightless species or something that was very close to being flightless and spend most of his time on the ground. However, now with all this material that we are, um, we've actually just submitted this paper uh, to a journal last week. <clears throat> we now think that this, we, we don't see any evidence that the wings were shorter. We don't see any evidence that the legs were particularly much more stronger than the wings. So we think that this is a species that could, could fly like any other species. So this is an incredible, Thing in my mind because these birds must have had a span width about three meters and can you imagine being just maybe a meter tall and then you have this big towering bird standing over you when you try to grab a piece of meat it must have been an incredibly intimidating environment for hobbits um, so yeah to summarize for the giant marabou stork we know that there's um, a number of individuals and yes they are probably active flyers which means if they were any similar to the species that we see in Africa, they probably um, took off soaring in the middle of the day and probably would spend hours on the wing trying to locate food or, or see any predators and trying to find nests. So I, I, yeah, I think it must have been an amazing sight if you had been on the island back then. <clears throat> we also think that they were breeding in the trees nearby Liangbua. Uh, because it's a bit weird to find these large birds inside a cave. Um, they don't breed in caves, at least not that we think of. Uh, we know that there's large trees in the area, so we think that they must have been breeding there locally. Um, what might have attracted them to the cave is, is a good question. 
um, we think that because there were so many small elephant remains lying in the cave, something or someone must have brought those in. At this point, we don't really, we're not really sure who that was, but it must have attracted all these scavenging birds to the cave, the, not just the giant marabou stork, but also the vultures. And they were probably um, attracted to it and just came because they knew they could get food there. Um, and those, those vultures were actually very dependent upon these storks and to scare other animals away. We see that today in Africa. We see that they are working together to scare even hyenas away. Um, and funnily enough, these even though these giant marabou storks were so big, their pointy bill doesn't really help in opening up large carcasses. So in order to open those large carcasses, they needed the vultures. So it's, it's a very interesting example of how these species were likely very closely associated with each other. And we find them only in the layers together. We don't find any layers with only one or two. We either find them all together or we don't. So for us, that's a very strong indication that these were all very closely associated to them. And um, so far, we don't have any evidence that hobbits were ever on the menu for storks. Um, I've had that question several times, particularly when I first published this, uh, this giant marabou stork in 2010. Um, we don't have any evidence for that. However, if you're thinking about the size of a small hobbit, it probably would have been the same size as a large, large rat, particularly when you think of hobbit babies. So we can't rule it out that they might have occasionally been eaten by a stork, but we don't really have any evidence for that at all. And similarly to the to the, the Komodo dragon, to the stegodon, to the vulture, these animals also disappear from Liangbua around 50,000 years ago. So yeah, no, no hobbit babies for, for marabou storks. So this is a, uh, an image that I just wanted to show to highlight uh, what we see in Africa today, which I think was very, is very similar to what was happening at Liangbua 50, 60,000 years ago. Um, this is a carcass of an elephant where there's a large number of vultures and some marabou storks are waiting for them. Uh, they're squabbling, they're fighting over it, but they are all attracted to this carcass. And I think something similar happened at Liangbua several times in the past as well. But this is a very distinctly African view. We only see these things in Africa, whereas <clears throat> this probably also happened in the past in other parts of the world, but now we just we've missed all that information. All the animals have gone extinct. So the only place that we still see it is in Africa. But I think this was a much more widespread phenomena in the Pleistocene. And to really um, drive home that message, we asked the paleo artist Gabriel Ugueto to make a reconstruction of Liangbua, not focusing on the hobbits. They're in the picture, but they're very far away. <clears throat> But instead, we wanted to focus on the animals. So we have a couple of marabou storks. They're uh, fighting over a carcass. There's uh, some white-headed vultures there. And there's a juvenile Komodo dragon that's also trying to get its share. But it's being chased away by some of the marabou storks. So you're actually the first ones to see it because this is part of the paper that we submitted. So uh, I'm very happy to be able to present this. I'm very excited about this, that it's a reconstruction of the cave that does not focus on the hominin, but instead focuses on all the other bird species and animals that are there, which in my mind is a lot more interesting and useful. <clears throat> so yes, if we're talking about um, the real fellowship of the Hobbit to stay in Tolkien's words, I think this is what we're looking at. Um, a lot of it did not center around the Hobbits. Uh, I think a lot of it was centered on the large herbivores. They are the main prey item, the stegodon in this case. They are the main prey item of Komodo dragons, of giant storks, of vultures, and probably also of hobbits. Whether they actively hunted stegodons or not, or if they were mainly scavengers, uh, we really don't know at this point. Um, they had primitive stone tools. Um, and it, nothing really points to that they were actively hunting stegodons, but at the same time, it's hard to explain the assemblage of stegodon bones that we found in the cave. So at this point, that's an open question. 
However, what, what we do know is that all these animals were probably attracted to these carcasses. And uh, these could all have been scavengers. Uh, even Homo floresiensis could very well have been a scavenging uh, a scavenger that was just trying to steal a bit of meat of these large herbivores. Um, so in that way, they were all connected and they were all very much dependent upon each other. And <clears throat> when we think back about the data, what the, the, the rats show, that there was a shift from a mostly open environment to an environment with a lot more forest, a lot less grass, uh, that might indicate that there was some kind of environmental change that really reduced the habitat for these stegodons. Um, and if this stegodon, if the population became reduced or if they even went extinct, this would have meant that all these other animals probably went with it one by one because they were so closely associated to each other. They were dependent upon each other. And it's almost like a house of cards. If you pull out one card, everything else just tumbles down. And that might explain what happened at Liangbua because everything, every one of them disappears around 50,000 years ago. Um, we know that Komodo dragons survived somewhere else. Um, they, and, and even maybe some of these animals survive somewhere else on Flores longer. Uh, we don't know that. At this point in time, we only have uh, a final a stratigraphic record that goes back long enough in time from Liangbua. So it might very well be that on, on the eastern part of the island, Stegodons were surviving longer. Giant storks were surviving longer. Maybe even hobbits survived longer. We don't know. But at this point in time, for Liangbua, they disappear around 50,000 years ago. And a lot of evidence is pointing towards the fact that they were all dependent upon Stegodon. And that when Stegodon went, maybe because as a result of reduced, in, reduced habitats, reduced grasslands, uh, that then everything else collapsed. So that, I think, fits the evidence that we're seeing very well. But hopefully, if we were able to find more sites on floors with an equally good stratigraphic time range, then we could really test this idea. Um, so that is, is the focus of your further research is trying to identify other sites on floors where we can test this idea. Maybe we can even find the, the black tephra marker there as well. So we, the, the, that we could even link it to, to each other. So that would be really, really interesting. So um, I really hope that we can go back to Flores very soon because we have a lot of questions and we have a lot of new things that we want to excavate and find out. So uh, hopefully I can even come back maybe in five years and hopefully pick up the story from here. Who knows? So um, I think that's, that's it for now. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, my conclusions. Um, so in short, I think the Pleistocene Flores uh, hosted a very unique uh, fauna where Stegodon was actually the only large herbivore and all the others were scavengers and also Homo floresiensis was a part of this ecosystem. It was not something special. It was, it functioned within this ecosystem. And all the evidence that we have today, as I said earlier, it's pointing towards the fact that everything disappears around 50,000 years ago, probably because of ecological changes that led to a more, um, closed environment. And as I said earlier as well, um, they might have survived somewhere else on Flores, um, but future research will see if we're right or not. So hopefully we'll, uh, we can find some more interesting evidence for that. Um, and then just as I was preparing for this talk today, uh, I came up uh, upon this. There's a book published by uh, actually three days ago it was published by a certain Gregory Forth. And Gregory Forth is someone who has done a lot of ethnographic uh, uh, research on Flores, <clears throat> particularly into the legend of Abu Gogo. And Abu Gogo um, uh, refers to the story of small humans on Flores. The, it, there's a lot of legends on Flores that describe a, a small creatures that are still alive today that come into the night and that steal babies. Um, and he has taken this legend and has done a lot of research on it. He suggests, or he thinks that it might still be alive on Flores. Even people have gone looking for it. 
I don't think there's a lot of evidence that they have survived on Flores. So I don't think this particularly holds a lot of water. Um, but it's interesting to see that Flores is still very much a topic that comes up in controversy. So, um, yeah, maybe we'll find it one day, but I don't think we will. Um, I think everything went extinct. Maybe not at 50,000 years ago, but maybe a little bit later, but I don't think any of them uh, still survive. Although I would really, really like to see a giant stork, but I think uh, I don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Um, I have not done this alone at all. I'm part of a big team. Um, a lot of them are local people that have been excavating and working with us for a very long time, and they form an essential part of our research. So um, this post is dedicated to them, the people from Taras, Golo Menuk, and Bere, uh, and all the Indonesian archaeologists that we work with. And then there's a, a range of other scientists involved in this. So. As I said, we're not doing this alone, we're part of the team. So thank you. I'm happy to answer all the questions that you might have. Thank you very much for that, Annika. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, I have to say, I've, I've seen you give tiny portions of that talk before, uh, and it was a real joy to actually see the relaxed, full-blown landscape introduction of all the detailed detail of the past. I mean, it really posed, painted such a rich picture. And, you know, yeah. we've had so much that you, you covered in terms of, you know, uh, Stegodon Jenga, which was, <laughs> uh, and uh, so many, there's a lot of questions that we've got a few come in and there's a, uh, several that I have uh, um, okay. uh, myself. So uh, hopefully you'll stay with us a little bit longer. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Uh, for this um, Terrell Museum speaker series uh, sponsored by the Cooperating Society, um, I should quickly flag up um, that next week's uh, presentation uh, will be one of your uh, near neighbours in Oslo, uh, uh, Dr. Aubrey Roberts. Um, she's currently doing postdoc at the University of Oslo, working on early Triassic bone beds in Svalbard. And uh, Next week, she's going to be uh, using Svalbard as um, as a sample to il illustrate the, the history of life on Earth. So that's going to be a fascinating romp to uh, uh, wind up our speaker series for this year. Um, so hopefully you'll uh, tune in for that next week. Um, I, think I, I, was, I was wondering with the... Um, you referred to this erosional surface that seemed mm. to be quite un unusual and, and really, really striking within the stratigraphy. Mm. Um, I mean, within a cave environment, do you have, is there any sort of theories as to why that, um, what would have caused such a striking erosional surface within that, that environment? And, you know, is it tied into the potentially what changed, the, what caused the funnel turnover? Um, well, the Liambua is part of a karst system, so there's always water running through it uh, in some form or shape. Um, and there's also a nearby river that we know has changed course over the last 60,000 years ago. Uh, it was initially a lot closer to the, to the cave, um, and that river also cut down uh, the valley. So we know initially let's say 50,000 years ago, it was a lot higher and closer to the cave. So we think that occasional flooding, particularly during wet periods, might have resulted to overflowing into the cave and then slowly have eroded away some of the, the sediments that were nearest to the cave mouth and that might have progressively worsened over time. Okay. Um, try and deal with uh, some of these uh, questions. Um, uh, one question um, in terms of the the, the specimens between um, found by Verhoeven and the hom the human specimens in the Homo floresiensis, there's no uh, evidence of any crossover there, is there? They're quite um, uh, separated by the think, period of time. Yeah, the Verhoeven. Um, so the strategy of the cave varies a little bit depending on where in the cave you are. Um, from what we've seen of Verhoeven's material and from what we've understand from his notes, 
he did not go deep enough to come close to the Hobbit sediments. And also we do not see any, any um, evidence for species that we know are in the Hobbit layer. So we do not see any stegodon in his material. We do not see any giant storks. It's mostly just rats and introduced species. So we have a pretty good idea that he did not, in fact, go down into the Hobbit layers. Yeah. Even though it's tempting to think that maybe he did, but I don't think he did. I, I think he stayed above it. Yeah. But can you imagine what would have happened if he had done that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he would have been recalled very, very quickly from his uh, missionary work. But uh, Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, what about, uh, is there any molecular data from the um, Floridiensis? And um, does it complement the ancestral hypothesis? Unfortunately, the, because the cave is located in such a warm and humid environment, DNA degrades very, very quickly. And uh, I think there have been some attempts at sampling um, the Hobbit material, but they have not yielded any usable DNA fragments for um, any analysis. I know people have also tried on some of the pigs from the Holocene, and I think even that was already very tricky because it's so warm, the DNA degrades so very quickly that it's, yeah, we, 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 I would love to know if there was a way we could do DNA uh, on the Pleistocene material, not because of the Hobbit, because, you know, I don't think that's very interesting, but I would love, love to do it on, on the, the giant stork material, because um, yeah, I have a lot of questions of where that animal came from. Um, but I'm, I'm a minority in that regard, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's no DNA, no. Okay. Um, I was going to say is there's another question on the uh, follow up, basically, to, I think, to Mike Morwood's theory. I mean, uh, does it seem to support uh, his original hypothesis that Flores was part of the route uh, through to Sauerland and uh, ultimately Australia? I mean, is the, that's supported <laughs> by the discoveries. Um, we well, uh, I don't think he really got a, found an answer for that at the time. Um, we, we don't really know if Flores was part of the route to, to Australia. There's, there's different ideas on that. We know that modern humans are on, on Sumatra by 72,000 years ago. Um, so we know that they were in the area. They must have gotten to the islands not too long after. We know that they're in Australia by, what is 64,000 years? If we, if we really take like the oldest evidence for what it is. Um, so they might have been around at the time. We, it's just that we haven't really found evidence for modern humans that early at Liangbuan. The oldest evidence that we have is molar that comes from just above the Black Tuff. So it would have been around 45,000, um, but it's, it's one molar. So it's not a, a lot of evidence, but we know that they are around in the area around 45,000 years ago. So. Um, whether they had gotten onto floors, whether they had made it all the way to inland. Yeah, those are interesting questions. It's it's hard to tell. Yeah. I mean, you say one molar, but one molar is like a larger statin to a mammal worker, surely. It could be, but there's also a lot of, you know, erosion. And, and I think it, one molar could easily be reworked from layers higher up. Um, yeah, so it could have gone on a journey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I would I would like to see a little bit more evidence there, like like a, a more complete skeleton that is not disturbed, or at least some bones. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say with uh, with respect to the stone tools, um, are they pebble tools or hand axes? What's the de degree of development? I haven't really said much of the stone tools because um, um, I tried to keep it within one hour, which I barely managed <laughs> at this point. Uh, and also because it's not really my field of expertise, but from what I understand from the people who have looked at them, they're relatively simple handheld uh, flakes, like both micro flakes and some larger flakes and hand access, but not very sophisticated, not the multifaceted, um, like full on symmetrical hand axes that we see in Europe. No, they were very simple, um, simple, but effective 
flakes and and stone tools, but nothing yeah. nothing really sophisticated. No. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering in terms of the the potential for you know how they were scavenging yeah. or hunting. Um, yeah. Yeah. One question: Are there any paleonathids in Lingua? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> no. That was when, when we found the bones of that large stork, um, that of course crossed my mind that maybe we have something very, very interesting here, but um, we do, but it's not a paleonathan, no. Yeah. Okay. No. Um, but, but there was recently a paper from Papua New Guinea where people were apparently raising cassowary chicks uh, 15,000 years ago, which is really a very interesting thing to look at when you're thinking about domestication of species yeah um, so it's um yeah it's uh, i'm still thinking about that paper so <laughs> um a question do any fossil specimens of presently migrating birds which might have stopped in ancient floras provide an insight on the biogeography of floras at the time of the hobbits in terms of migration being shaped by biogeographical barriers? That's a very, very good question. This is something I want to look closer into because um, paleo flyways, as they refer to, they might have changed over time. And we know that now there's a major migration route that crosses, uh, that actually extends from Siberia through Asia, Southeast Asia, all the way to Australia. Um, it might have been different in the past. Um, I haven't really looked into it in that great detail, but um, it's definitely a very interesting thing to think about. And it's something hopefully I will look into more in the future. Yeah. A um, Couple of questions from uh, Clinton, um, asking if the cave was part of a karst network, which I think you've already yeah. answered. And there's an active flow of water through it that could have transported much of the sediment onto the cave, cave floor. So yeah, I think, that's a yes for that. Yeah, there's actually a, a subterranean chamber under the cave, oh. which by some people has been referred to as the Hobbit basement. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, so it is part of a car system, yes. And there's also actually a cave site right next to it that has no sediment at all. This is very strange. Okay. Um, yeah. I still like the idea of it being a rat cave, though. It's um, got all sorts of... Um, popular culture references there that uh, it does it does um were there were there not predatory mammals that could have used the cave and could have caused the deposition of many of the bones asks Lenson. uh no uh a good question though because that is what we would expect if that cave had been on mainland asia um however because uh flores being an island that had never had any land bridges uh, a lot of carnivorous mammals were never able to make it to Flores because they not really good at swimming. So, for example, uh, on for example in Thailand and, and Vietnam, cave sites there often show a lot of signs of porcupines that we do not see on Flores at all. Only except for like the last five thousand years when they are actually introduced to the island. That's when we see porcupines, and they do drag in animals and they eat everything except the teeth. Uh, but we do not see that on Flores. Yeah. There was one sidebar question about the white eyes and are they differentiated on different islands by the variation in their songs and repertoires or do you have to use genetic data to differentiate them? Um, they are actually different on many of the islands. Um, don't ask me to tell the difference because they all look the same to me, but they are differentiated by their songs, but also genetics. And some species are actually older than others. So it seems that there have been multiple waves of these white eyes for different islands. So for example, one a white eye colonizes an island, uh, lives in the forest. During a dry period, the forest uh, contracts to a mountaintop. And then in a warmer period, it extends down again. And then you get a new white eye coming in that colonizes the lowland forest. So you have the older one higher up and the new one is in the lowland forest. It's very interesting, but it makes it very confusing from a, from a, um, a taxonomic point of view because it's, it's, it gets complicated very quickly. 
But for the bones, I can say that they all look alike. And the only thing I can say is that it's a wide eye. Um, so it's hard to say which species it is, but um, they are fascinating. They, I find them very fascinating, but it's, they're very difficult to identify from, from the bones alone, unfortunately. Um. Okay, uh, I think, uh, let me just check if we have one more. Uh, yes, apart from the pygmy mammoths, were there any other megafauna um, like pachyderms on Flores and the surrounding Wallacea islands? It seems that every island had its own, at least one stegodon species or at least one, one pygmy elephant or elephant. Um, Flores actually had th three uh, consecutive ones. Um, there's, when we go back to the beginning of the Pleistocene, there was a very, very small one called Stigodon uh, Sondari. Uh, that one went extinct. And then it seemed that there was a new wave of animals that came in, including a larger Stigodon, that is Stigodon florensis. That one gradually declined in size until the one we see at Liangbua. That's a direct descendant of that one. So there's a, there's a direct time uh, lineage between those. They're, those two were very closely related probably. Um, but yeah, uh, Timor, Sulawesi, Java, um, Sumba, uh, all of these islands had at least one species of pachyderm. And we know that elephants were very good at swimming. Uh, they even have a snorkel, as some people say, so they know how to cross water. So they were very good at colonizing all these islands. And that is reflected in the fossil record. Definitely. That's cool. Um, I think uh, you might be lucky that that's um, uh, the last of the questions, unless somebody wants to get in very quickly. Um, uh, so uh, it remains for me to, to say thank you once again for um, sharing the, the richness of your understanding of Lingua uh, with us today. Yeah, um, no, it, I mean, um, I think you even managed to touch on cryptozoology uh, right yeah, at the end. Yeah. So you, you ticked an awful lot of boxes for one hour. It was, it was uh, an exceptional trip. Yeah, um, yeah Darren would, Darren Nash would love that. Um, I also uh, particularly thank you for giving us that that scoop, that sneak preview of the painting. Um, and it was uh, good that you made clear that um, the, the hobbits were far away. Uh, I wasn't sure if they were actual size uh, in, in that standing next to the marabou. So saying they're far away was, was, was most helpful. Um, and uh, let me see. Sorry, Clinton, if you've got a, one last question, uh, nothing's turned up in the feed. Oh, it's going to be tense whether he can actually get the question in uh, at the last minute. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll say again, if um, anybody can, uh, uh, if people can uh, tune in next week for Aubrey Roberts, um, who will be speaking to us uh, about the history of life uh, through the, the lens that is Svalbard. Uh, Aubrey's particularly um, uh, an ichthyosaur specialist, so I'm very sure that any marine reptile buffs out there are not going to be disappointed by Aubrey's uh, presentation. Um, cool. Clinton, apparently he asked about a rat being named after Laura. Laura, there's one named after Paula. The one after Paula, yes. That was, was that his second wife or his first wife? Well, so Verhoeven was actually a very interesting figure because, um, at one point, he returned to the Netherlands, uh, and he was always very conflicted about being a priest because, uh, well, of reasons. Uh, when he came back to the Netherlands, he denounced uh, celibacy, um, and he actually married an ex-nun named Paula and lived happily ever after with him. So it's definitely a very interesting story. <laughs> he was an interesting character. Okay. Um, I, I don't know where the, the, the Laura came from, uh, Clinton. Sorry about that. Uh, we, we missed out on that. Um, but if you email afterwards, I might be able to forward it on to... to yeah, to sure. I'm happy to answer questions over email as well. People, you know, have some urgent questions.
And I, I particularly thank you for this uh, season of uh, the speaker series. I think you're the only presenter who's actually presented from the inside um, of their uh, study area with the uh, Ling Bua Cave in, in the background behind you. Yeah. Uh, I think, yes, I think that's uh, <laughs> very unusual. Um, so with that, I'll say uh, uh, thank you very much again for uh, your, your time. I know you're very pressing uh, schedule this week and it's really great you could uh, fit us in and it's very much appreciated and don't forget to everybody to uh, tune in next week for the last in our speaker series um, as sponsored by the Cooperating Society uh, but for now uh, Dr. Hanukkah Meyer thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you for having me.